I'm the director of jazz studies here at Sarabek College and run this band. And we are so happy to share this music with you this evening. Uh, you guys are probably getting busy as we get into the fall, and yet you're here, so we very much appreciate your time, Carmen, uh, some time out of your lives to share it with us. That first one was Miss Fine by Oliver Nelson. Uh, if you're not familiar with Oliver Nelson, he was a wonderful musician born in the Midwest and then <clears throat> moved to New York and uh, played with Louis Jordan, actually, and the Technique Five and wrote for them and then ended up uh, in the military out in Japan. It's, that's where he actually heard, for the first time in his life, the music of uh, Maurice Ravel, a very famous French Impressionistic composer, and it kind of changed his life. And at that point, he decided 
he not only, not only wanted to be a saxophonist, but a composer, and became a really great composer. And many of you have probably heard his music without realizing it, because in 1967, he moved from New York to Hollywood and ended up writing for a bunch of television shows like uh, Ironsides, Columbo. Those are the shows I watched as a kid. <laughs> Actually, I still watch Columbo sometimes. <laughs> on late night. I, I never get tired of it, even though I know it's going to happen. Yeah. Peter Frog. Anyhow, yeah, he was a wonderful uh, arranger and composer, and uh, we were lucky to have him here on the West Coast. Unfortunately, he died uh, tragically from a genetic heart disease. They say, actually, he was only 43. They say it was from the stress of writing for movies and television. So that's why I don't do that. <laughs> actually, the main reason I don't do it is because no one asked me to. They consider my music a little bit too weird, I think. Uh, so, speaking of great composers, we're going to continue now with one by Horace Silver, also a gentleman who made his career. He was one of the founding members of uh, the Jazz Messengers before Art Blakey took over and uh, spent most of his career on the East Coast, but he was out here at the end of his life, not the very end, but the, the, towards the end. And I used to see him at poetry readings and stuff. He lived in Venice Beach. His name was Horace Silver. And the gentleman who arranged this is a wonderful composer, arranger, and trumpet player down in San Diego named Carl Sukup. We hope you enjoy it. Actually, what tune is this? Wrong composer. Seven Steps to Heaven by pianist and vibraphonist Victor Feldman. Also, I see a theme to this concept that I didn't even know we had lived out here in Los Angeles. And uh, he was from London originally and uh, came out here as part of the cool scene in the 50s. It's Carl's take on his seven steps to heaven. I know I'm talking a lot, but I should point out that Miles Davis, like he did in many cases with his site, and tried to take credit for composing this song. He didn't.
Uh, I'm going to introduce all the guys to me in the second half, but you can see the band is full of really great players, and in, in my 20 years here, this has been one of the funnest bands to conduct. <clears throat> you can see that my conducting doesn't require much. These guys. I, I oftentimes, uh, you know, I occasionally, because I'm old now, people ask me to write books on how to conduct a jazz band, and I said, I'm glad to do that, but basically it would be, you know, you'd open it up and it would say, don't because you rehearse a jazz band and then you just try to stay out of everyone's way during the concert. One of my favorite stories about that is when my kids were in choir, the choir director, Ms. Norris, would have the kids conduct the choir and my daughter, Clarissa, whenever she was conducting the choir, she was you know, doing really well. And Mrs. Norris said, uh, Corey, that was beautiful. Have you conducted before? She said, no, but my dad's a conductor you know, for the big band. And she, she said, was well, that where you learned? She said, no, this is how he conducts. One, two, one, two, three. So, still aspiring to get as good as her. We're going to continue now with a really beautiful composition it's by a pianist also who lived up here, Jimmy Rolls. Uh, and he was a, a wonderful musician. I you know, had the pleasure of meeting and hearing him before he passed away. And, uh, he, he was just a really tremendous musical person. He wrote just a couple of tunes. He didn't write a lot of tunes, but the tunes he wrote were really beautiful. This is one of them entitled The Peacocks, and it's a, an arrangement to feature Tanner, our Barry and bass clarinet specialist, and it's by one of my uh, uh, greatest colleagues and uh, mentor, Mr. Bill Homo. We hope you enjoy The Peacocks. Thank you. 
email with one of mine. This is actually one that I wrote many, many years ago called Miss Rogers Boots. And it's kind of a funny story because I, I really never ran a big band until I started teaching. I ran an 11 piece band. Uh, long story why it was 11 pieces. Don't mean anything like that. But uh, I was honored to win the Sammy Nesterko Award. Uh, back when we had just moved to New York, and Sam Nestico uh, just recently passed away, but he was a wonderful arranger also out here in Los Angeles. He was uh, retired down in San Diego for the past decade or so, and uh, still very active writing and arranging. And uh, I, I was honored to win this. It's given out by the Airmen of Note, which is uh, the top jazz military band uh, in the Navy, uh, based out there in Washington, D.C. It actually, the Airmen of Note, the, this might amuse some of you. The origins of it were, it was originally Glenn Miller's orchestra uh, from World War II. Anyhow, so one of the uh, things after I, I submitted this piece and, and won the award was that, uh, you know, they pay you to do a commission. And so I actually took this existing melody that I had, and one of the reasons I chose it was because the military was going to do the copy work. I just write, I still to this day, I'm sort of old school, I just write with pencil and paper where everyone else uses computers. So I knew that it was a really long chart. Like, how, how many pages is the alto part? 23 pages, yeah. It's just kind of like Tolstoy. <laughs> Anyhow, the thing is, man, I figure we're all paying tax dollars and a lot of us go to the military, they might as well pay to, you know, write a long chart for us. So. This is Miss Rogers' boots. <laughs> Any, I'm sorry, does anyone here have a, what do you call those, helper dogs? Okay, because you're going to want to leave the room. The piccolo's going to be here.
we're going to close out the first half uh, with a wonderful composition. This is another one, kind of off the opposite of the other Miles tune. Everyone thinks this tune was composed by Charlie Parker in the published version that we're going to play, which is arranged by the great Bill Holman. Uh, he has the composer list as Charlie Parker. However, Kay Akagi, who is the director of jazz studies at UCI, who was the last keyboardist to play with Miles Davis, insists, and Miles always maintained, he would admit to stealing the other charts, like the ones that Bill Evans wrote and everything, but he claims that he did indeed compose this one. It's entitled Donna Lee. Uh, we hope you will stick around for the second half. We've got some really exciting music for you there. We're going to play a brand new one, and, uh, and I'm going to introduce all the cast to you and tell you about their, well, their time in jail and their personal histories. <laughs>
for the second half. That was uh, the song I introduced earlier. <laughs> Not built by Horace Silver, arranged by Carl Sukup, our, uh, Sukup, our friend down in San Diego. Um, I want to announce a couple of uh, guest stars we have coming up. We're really fortunate to get uh, funding from our dean and ASG and other people to help bring in really great guest artists. Uh, this month, in a couple of Wednesdays on the 19th, we have from New York, Dan Wise, is an excellent uh, percussion. He's also a, has, uh, studied with a tabla player who's his guru for over 25 years now. And he'll be here with the duo with the new recording they're promoting with the New York guitarist from Japan, Miles Okazawa. And they'll be doing a duo concert. Uh, it won't be at nighttime, it'll be during our combo class, which is at 4 o'clock at Fine Arts 103. It's a free event. And we encourage you to come check that out. Uh, really blessed to have such creative, uh, you know, unique contemporary music here. And along those lines, in November, on the second Tuesday in November, we have coming all the way from Paris, uh, you know, France, not the one in the desert here. Uh, and uh, it's Francois Mouton and his twin brother. I can't think of his name, but his last name's Mouton. <laughs> And uh, the, Francois plays bass, and his brother plays drums, and they have a sax player from France joining them as well. And that will be here on the stage at 7.30, and we encourage you to come and check that out. And of course, we always have uh, the lab bands got their concert coming up the Monday before Thanksgiving, and then this ensemble will be doing our annual holiday concert, I think the second Saturday or Friday in December. You'll get an announcement. If you need to be informed, instead of me personally calling each and every one of you, uh, just talk to our uh, house manager, Elliot, and they'll get you on the mailing list. Uh, we're going to continue now with a song by our dear friend. He used to live here in Los Angeles, John DeVersa, and he's now at the University of Miami. Uh, many of us call him a traitor for that. And uh, he's uh, one of our favorite people, and this is one of his goofy charts entitled Camels.
section. You heard him earlier playing lovely on the bass clarinet, also plays uh, baritone saxophone. You don't have any flute on this concert, but normally he would have a flute, an oboe, a bassoon, and a wheelbarrow. That's Tanner. 
very delighted. I this is his uh, first semester with the band, and we're just delighted to have him there. Next to him, a gentleman who was playing Barry uh, last semester with us and switched to second tenor and does a wonderful job, as you heard him blowing earlier. And he's one of our local music educators, and we really love him a lot. That's Nate Wilson. Our tremendous young musician on lead alto. Uh, he was a high school student here locally, Tribuca Hills, right? And then he went off to the August Institution of the University of North Texas, one of the oldest jazz programs uh, in the country, and one of the best. And now he's back doing his master's work over at USC. Look at him, he's all grown up. That's Trevor English. Back section. Uh, a gentleman who was one of our music majors, and after he completed all the coursework, he decided he wanted to make money, and so he's now majoring in mathematics or something. What are you majoring in now, Ben? Physics and applied math. <laughs> so he's frightening at cocktail parties, and not just because of those glasses, it's the conversation. Mr. Ben Chasen. <laughs> Next to him, delighted to have in our band, also one of our former music students, went on, was not smart enough to get out of music. <laughs> and are you doing master's work now? He's just getting done with his bachelor's over at Cal State Florida, and we're delighted that he was able to return. It's always wonderful as a, you know, an older dude who was teaching them when they were younger to have him come back and just witness the amazing and, and wonderful musical growth. That's, Dan Rowe, Daddy Rowe. I just noticed, man, I'm so glad my wife is here tonight. She's normally not here, but she's going to have to come back after the concert, honey, because all these guys have mustaches. I mean, look at this. This is like mustache city up here, man. My wife has no tolerance for the mustache. I don't know if you guys remember when Tyler McGough was in the band and he had that, like, evil, sort of Dr. Evil mustache. It was not kind when she said, Dan. <laughs> Anyhow, how about him for a sad section? Yeah. Oh, we're going to play a new one now. Does, do you guys have the program you think you can do? What's, what's the title listed in the program on this one? Okay, good. So this was actually a commission for APU, which when I titled it, I didn't realize, uh, you know, it's a private Christian university. So the gentleman who was kind enough to commission me asked me to change the title. So for us, it's moderately epic conjugal relations. For them, it's moderately epic philosophical inclinations. And I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. 
Company. Let's talk about the brass section. Uh, anchoring the brass section, a uh, gentleman also smart enough not to major in music over at Cal State Long Beach. Is it history or history major? Jeff Amzaradel on the bass trombone. One of our uh, wonderful music students here at Sutherland College next to him. He studies classical trombone with Professor Mike Hoffman, who uh, lives here in Michigan, but he's the principal trombone player in the PSL, and he's a really, really great trombone player, and so is Elijah. That's Elijah Parra. <laughs> Joining us on lead trombone, and you've heard him solo beautifully. Really a pleasure to have in the band. Uh, uh, another one uh, that we pilfered over from Cal State Long Beach and uh, appreciate him joining us. That's Michael Newfield on the trombone. Thank you. Thank you. A gentleman who was in the band for many years and then left us to go make money. Uh, and he's fortunately still making money, but he picked up the trombone again. And as you've heard tonight, it's wonderful creative energy. That's Mr. James Shu on the trombone. going down in estimation from the trombones to the trumpets. Just kidding. As we all know, the trombone is the most godlike of instruments. Yeah. Uh, one of our young jazz trumpet uh, students, really uh, wonderful to watch him grow in such a short period of time. He's with us in his third semester, second year. And you've heard it tonight, that's Mr. Brian Watson on the trumpet. Next to him, a gentleman who's been in the band and, and uh, is a delight to have around and is also the social director. That's Mr. Keith. <laughs> My mind is going, Keith Ransom, yes, it's been going fast. Uh, next to him, one of the finest lead trumpet, well, as a, a great lead trumpet player told me once, that Wayne Bergeron said to me, the finest lead trumpet player of his generation right here at Sutter College. That's Mr. Ryan DeWeese. <laughs> it just occurred to me that Ryan is also an excellent jazz player, and I'm thinking, yeah, you should have said something. I forgot to give Ryan a solo. Uh, next to him, uh, also one of the finest trumpet players of his generation, and uh, a very funny dude, too. That's Mr. Harry Ostrander on the trumpet. <laughs> We're going to feature young Ben Chasen uh, on a beautiful tune by Thelonious Monk. This was actually arranged by Frank Foster. Frank was one of our Jazz Day uh, artists some, uh, some years ago, He's since passed on. And uh, it, it's just a beautiful treatment of this Monk tune. We hope you enjoy Ben's version.
piano player and we're kind of liking it because <laughs> we have two really, as you've heard, great guitarists uh, on stage left. Uh, that's Zane Johnson. And stage right, we call him thing one and thing two, it's like a Dr. Seuss thing. <laughs> that's uh, Will Luster. sock contest afterwards between Trevor and Will. Looks like, a, looks like Will my daddy. Uh, we have two excellent drummers, as you've heard, sitting behind the kit right now, and playing on this last one is Keaton Burns, one of our music majors. And behind him physically, but not emotionally or age-wise, is uh, another one of our uh, young uh, music major drummers, Mr. Joseph Pena. Really fortunate to have this gentleman uh, with us. He was one of our music students some quite some years ago. I don't know what, where it was, but he was around for a little while. And one of our uh, students who made so much progress, which is great, and then he went off to uh, Cal State Northridge and got his degree, and recently, a few years ago, he was on one of John DeVerse's uh, recordings uh, and got uh, a Grammy for that. So that's Rodrigo Morgan on the bass. And our normal bassist who was doing this wasn't available to do it, so I called Rodrigo to do the audition night, you know, just thinking he would help out. And I was just delighted he, he was able, uh, since he's moved closer now, it would be hard to do from Northridge to, to us. Are you an RSM? Yeah. So he's close enough by where he can do the band. It's just a delight to have him in here. Also, yeah. he bailed us out because he agreed to play in two combos. So on Wednesdays, Rigo's here from 4 in the afternoon till 10 at night. He's got that big, silly-ass smile on his face the whole time. <laughs> and uh, Rodrigo, thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, I'd like to also thank Mr. Kevin Maui, our sound and lighting technician. And I believe our new nighttime uh, gentleman is here tonight. Tristan, are you up there? There he is. Say hi to Tristan. Again, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and the middle and the top of our hearts for taking some time out of your life tonight to come uh, and let us share this music with you. We're going to close out with, uh, this is a really kind of a famous arrangement of, uh, 
uh, Stomping at the Savoy, which is an old swing tune. It's by Bill Holman once again. Bill is now, I think, 93. And uh, I called him recently because I had some questions. I was reading this book about West Coast jazz. And I thought, what? Man, that didn't sound right. And I realized that Bill was living it <laughs> here at the Lighthouse Cafe in the 1950s. So I called him and I got all the information I needed. Unlike me, his memory is fine. I can't figure that out. And um, he, this chart was the beginning. He booked, it was recorded in 1955, I believe, by the Stan Kenton Orchestra. Uh, without Bill's knowledge. <laughs> Bill used to play in the Stan Kitten Orchestra in the early 50s, and then they recorded this album, and they forgot to tell Bill they were recording his music. But what's funny about this is he's, this style on this chart was the sort of what they started calling, maybe not accurately, so the stream of consciousness sort of thing. And so when I spoke with Bill recently, we happened to be talking about writing, because I was working on a commission, and we got to talking about how much of the time you, you know, follow your plan. And he said to me, sometimes you follow your plan and sometimes it's like characters in a novel where they take on a life of their own. He says you have to at some point in the chart make a decision whether you're going to follow your plan or go with your intuition. And I thought, this is my chance. I'm going to ask the great Bill Holman. I said, Bill, if you were a gambling man, how much of a percentage of the time would you say you followed your plan and what percentage did you go with your, you know, intuition at the moment. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to be the guy who finds out, you know. And there was about, I don't know, four beats of silence, and Bill says, you're not going to catch me with your trickery. <laughs> it was on to me. Anyhow, we appreciate you guys coming out tonight, and uh, we hope you enjoy this final tune, Stomp at the Fort by the great Bill Holman.
Thank you all so very much for coming out. We'll see you next time.